We are live now and welcome to Thomas and Penny on the sofa in our BIP chat. And I hope we can keep your attention. If you're watching this back while you're driving the car, walking the dog, cooking, all these things that people do when they're listening in, I hope you feel this show gives you a lot of education and interest and hopefully a little bit of humour as well. Um, sometimes I drop a few bombs where I, I'm totally inappropriate, but I'll try not to be too inappropriate today. Um, so BIP chat stands for business is personal chat. So this is obviously a chat show and we've got some guests that I'm really looking forward to introducing you to. But let me first explain what BIP stands for. It's business is personal. And that's what we believe. In fact, everybody in this room with you today is believing that business is personal. And it's the juxtaposition of when somebody says, Penny, it's not personal, it's just business. And you really quite like to headbutt those people because um, business is very personal. How can we possibly separate our passion and our, our emotions about doing a good job for our clients and our team members if it's not personal? So, um, so we are today talking about a very important subject, which some of you might go, oh, that feels a bit dry, but my goodness, it isn't dry and it's very essential. And is that's the subject of keeping your IT on track and also making sure that you are cyber secure. And our guest today, Josh Bevis, owns Sonar IT. So if you want to look up Josh while you're listening to this on LinkedIn, it's Josh, Josh J-O-S-H, and Bevis, B-E-V-I-S. And his company is Sonar IT. Sonar is N-O-N-A-R-I-T. And now Josh started off, and I want to explore this a bit, as an apprentice. And so this gives Thomas and I great joy and then has built his business, which we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, just to show that he's got a lot of credibility and expertise. Um, when we're running our BIP 100 community, which is means there are 100 experts, we've now got 76. We recruit hard, not just for people with expertise, but people also with really super values who also want to be in a strong community environment. Um, that's very different to joining a network where people often burn through a network looking for sales um, our community is very much about sort of having that growth mindset, that collaborative mindset, that ability to give to others and communicate with great honesty to each other. So BIP100 is the platform that Thomas and I use to support small businesses and they mentor each other and are really quite amazing. So that's why Josh is here. We've got to know him and his dog and, um, and we've learned uh, that he's really rather super. So Josh, we asked you to bring somebody on that would also add some um, sort of real thoughts around this subject of IT support and cybersecurity. Would you like to introduce your guest, Akbar? Absolutely. So this is Akbar Ali. He was one of our first clients. We've been working together for well, nearly two years now. Uh, he owns a law firm based in the city. and They are eight users and they're up and coming and they're growing very, very quickly. And uh, we work very closely together. And I would like to think that he's slowly become a very good friend of mine and also a mentor as well. Oh, that's oh how lovely. Absolutely lovely. I don't, tell I it, don't say that to his face, though. Because well, well we had the pleasure. Oh, well, of you have said it now, so now I know. <laughs> <laughs> On the record it, now, Josh. <laughs> so uh, we had the pleasure of getting to know Akbar for about 15 minutes before we went live. So this is really going to be super. And actually, if we're talking about IT and cybersecurity, pretty good to have somebody who's one of Josh's clients here who runs a corporate law firm because <laughs> I can imagine. Um, there's a lot of diligence around making sure that that side of your business is strong. So very much welcome, Akbar. Thank you very much for joining us. So we're together until uh, for 45 minutes. We've got about 40 minutes left. Um, and um, as, a, as, a, as the wife here to Thomas, I have to make sure I create space because I tend to be a little bit, uh, I don't know, women like to talk, don't they? So I've, I've got to make sure that Thomas gets a chance to speak, but I do sort of chair this. So um, Thomas will give me the few nudges when I'm talking too much, but we want to really listen to you, Josh and Akbar. So I'm going to start with you, Josh. And I, I know this can be awkward, Akbar, when you're just sort of staring at a screen, waiting to have an opportunity to share. But um, Josh, let's, um, let's start with you, because I think it's really interesting that uh, your career, you started off as an apprentice, didn't you? So tell us a little indeed. bit about that. So I... I went to sixth form um, and school was never really my, my forte, if you will. Um, so I didn't really go to sixth form when I was there. Um, and I left in 2013 
do you pursue a career in IT, which is something I've always, always wanted to do. I've always been a bit of a nerd uh, sitting in my bedroom, playing on my computer. So it's always been a very big interest of mine. Um, so as I say, I went and joined an apprenticeship scheme uh, at a company called UA, and they help you go through the process, they get you on the training, they also prep you for an interview, and then companies essentially come in, interview you, and decide if they want to hire you or not. Um, so I did that for 13 months or so. I think I finished a little bit earlier because I was quite keen uh, to get it done and busted. And then I was kept on at the place I did the apprenticeship at, and I was what they call a first line engineer, so the first one. So whenever the phone rings, I was the guy that would pick it up and deal with most of the queries on the phone. Um, and as fun as challenging as that is, it does get very tiring, uh, especially when you're dealing with angry clients. Because obviously, in the world of IT, things don't always work, and it can be very frustrating. Um, but so during that time, I did build up my skill set, and I went into what they call second lines. You don't answer the phone as much, but you deal with the more harder tickets. Basically, you're there in the background, um, and in the kind of industry we're in, and the businesses we're in. Um, you, you either go into management or you specialise. Um, and what I wanted to do was specialise. So I went and did a project management call. Yeah. Um, and I was dealing with a lot of projects at the business I was, I was in. And basically my skill set grew and grew. And it got to the point where I was doing all sorts of roles. So I was doing projects, I was doing support, I was helping doing sales and account management. So I was essentially doing what I do now at Sony IP, but uh, for someone else. And a, an ex-colleague of mine reached out and he asked me to help him with cloud projects, doing some side work. And he paid me quite handsomely, even though it was at a very large uh, discounted rate. And that money helped me start Sony IT uh, and set it up. And now we are here two years later. So we started in January 2020. My first official day of Sony IT was the first day of lockdown. So I don't know if that's confidence or stupidity, however you want to look at it. Monday, uh, the 23rd of March. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Amazing. And your office is in Fleet Street. It's in Fleet right? Street, yeah. So it's actually just down the road from that at Bar's office. So yeah, we've got, got a nice big office in Fleet Street. Not many people come in because everyone works from home nowadays. And that's absolutely fine. I can't really convince you guys to come in when they work so efficiently at home. How big is your team now, Josh? We are eight members. Uh, so you've got me, my business partner, uh, and then you've got Sam, our sales director, and we've got the whole team as well. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've grown quite quickly. Um, as I say, COVID wasn't fun, especially at the start, but we it come and I think it was a very big client and it's just been rolling ever since um, and yeah, we, we sign a few clients uh, every other month and we're, we've got our, our fingers in loads of different kind of businesses from fintech to construction it's not an industry we don't support um, and not an industry we can't support either. Wonderful how wonderful so Akbar you you took a leap of faith and trust and became a, a client of Josh's so it'd be really interesting for us to hear from your, because a lot of our listeners will be small business owners. Um, that tends to be the audience that Thomas and I mostly have. Um, so as a, as a business owner, you know, tell us about why this is such an important subject to you, making sure your IT and your cybersecurity is right. Yeah, uh, so the security and then just generally the IT side of things, we come at it from quite a few different angles. We advise in the space of commercial contracts to clients. That has a big um, privacy uh, influence now because of GDPR and the developing laws in privacy. We're a regulated business, so we're a law firm with a group of solicitors that are uh, regulated by the Solicitors Regulation Authority. They come with their requirements. We have extensive uh, insurance requirements and as a business, we're on a similar timeline, a similar trajectory uh, as Sonar IT is. So we're bolting on more people. There's obviously a delicacy in the various different information involving people, the client matters that we have as well. Uh, so Sonar IT are really um, partly, uh, you know, I'd like to suggest that it's through careful selection of suppliers, but more likely it's through quite fortuitous uh, and just getting lucky uh, means with regards to sorry, see, similar trajectory. We're on a similar timeline. We're on a similar journey. Um, I happened to get to know Josh in, in the early stages of 2020. We did go with Sonar IT as our IT provider. Um, we certainly, in terms of pricing points, when you're evaluating these things, Sonar IT, I wouldn't say they're, they're the cheapest provider. I wouldn't say they're the expensive. They fall somewhere in the middle. I like the fact that there was a physical presence in the city. It's 
this cybersecurity information, it's a very hot, hot topic for lawyers and there's so many different ways um, we can fall foul of compliance if we don't have these things right. It certainly applies to other businesses generally. And, and the other thing which causes me to value and prioritize this is the commercial side of things as well. If we want to do a tender for legal work, if we want to apply for an accreditation, if we want to partner with a particular business or just be a law firm supplier to another business, being able to demonstrate uh, compliance, being able to demonstrate good cybersecurity protocols is really good for business for us. So for example, right now we're in the process of applying for the uh, conveyancing quality scheme. That's an accreditation that the law society afford to law firms to then get them on banking panels for um, conveyancing work. And we, we do do some conveyancing, but not a lot. When we, when we feature on this panel, we're able to do a lot more and that's a part of the business we're looking to grow. What we were able to do because we've had Sonar IT from day one is um, complete a lot of the forms, complete a lot of the uh, requirements with, I would say, a relative ease. And there are law firms that I know in the community that could have spent a year putting together a, a application for this particular accreditation. It's pretty big if that's the, the, the sort of area you want to go into as a law firm. And for us, it's been quite easy. Um, not easy, but certainly with, with more ease than it otherwise would have been because we have Sonar IT there, not just as an arm's length supplier, but more like a partner. Uh, and coming back to the start of this, this particular platform business is personal. Um, I absolutely agree. It absolutely is. And I don't think it's um, correct. And I actually don't think we're able to separate our lives in a neat and tidy way into this is business and this is personal. Uh, Josh, Josh's team, Sonar IT, they really care about our business. Um, they see our wins as their wins. They see our priorities as their priorities. They see our drivers as their drivers. So I often tell Josh, and I always look for opportunities to say good things about people as much as we often spend our time um, spending, uh, sorry, we spend our time a lot on on the negative you know the news is negative if something goes wrong that's when you talk to your supplier if there's a tense matter around money and invoicing that's when people start having a conversation well what i like to do um to to foster the good relations that we have around the firm is when something is done right i, I say so so one thing i often tell josh probably more so than than he'd like to hear it um is you know, business is never a straight line. We've gone on a zigzag line, a, a scribbled line, like many businesses. And we've made some mistakes. We've made some good decisions and absolutely picking Sonar IT uh, as the IT provider was, was one of the um, better decisions that was made. And that's the space within this business where I constantly have peace of mind uh, because of that reason. Wow. How oh, amazing. That's so beautiful to hear that. But also the priority you've placed on it is because so many small businesses, they've got their primary skill, whatever they're needing to deliver, their expertise. And then they've got all these raft of secondary skills and things that they need to do. But this sounds like this really is a very central, important aspect mm -hmm. of your business. Uh, what I would love, and I know, Thomas, you pro will probably want to start telling me to shut up and talk, but... When you were talking about this need for compliance and things like that, what are the things you have to demonstrate then about being compliant with cybersecurity, for example? So there's, it's a contractual thing. So if we have a client, um, just like any business, we have an engagement letter with that client. There's a contractual commercial relationship that's created and part of the uh, terms and conditions of that relationship is you know, you will, you will deal with the information that I give to you in order to do this work with a certain level of security, uh, sensitivity, delicacy, and, um, and just generally these clients of ours and, and just like a customer to a business in, in a general sense, and this is not just law firms, they need to be in a safe set of hands. Cyber security, because everything is digital now, you know, these, these calls, the, the emails that we do, the documents that we do, everything is in a digital space. So that safe set of hands 
uh, is, is something you can only provide with very good levels of cybersecurity. Uh, in regulatory terms as well, the solicitor's regulation authority um, require from the regulated uh, law firms to ensure a certain level of cybersecurity. And that's to maintain standards. You know, that regulation is there so the public can have confidence in law firms. So if somebody is given uh, the regulatory status of a solicitor's practice, a legal services provider is the terminology they use, um, then that's that's only done when the business in that particular space achieves a certain level of cybersecurity. And for us, it's not just we're doing it because we're told to do it or we're doing it because we have contracts with people where we, where we have to do it. Actually, it's good practice. Um, and actually, uh, it, it's fantastic for me not to have to spend uh, two, three, four hours, if I'm being very conservative, resolving a breach in security. So the fact that there, these breaches don't take place and don't use up my time, it's, it's not just the compliance thing, it's really good for business because then I can use that time more productively. And then it goes to the even more positive things where we're trying to get certain accreditations where we want to tender for a piece of work. We're able to say almost as a hallmark, look up you know, the cybersecurity standards that we have and we're treated with a certain level of um, respect and seriousness uh, as a result of that. Fantastic, isn't it? Agbar, can I ask you, does, does the regulator like the HMRC for VAT, does it, does the regulator perform spot checks and come in and check the work of Sonar and your firm that it's reached that level that's so required? Through, um, they, um, so it's, it's the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, which is our main regulator. They will, when you're above a certain level of turnover, it becomes more proactive and solicitors are expected to self-regulate but then report back to the SRA with any breaches any issues I'm very pleased to say uh, that Ali Legal haven't had any uh, breach in that respect to report and then you have sort of splintering off accreditation schemes like the conveyancing quality scheme where I have to submit a pack um, for this accreditation that's it could be two three hundred pages of policy documents, application forms, uh, declarations. Oh, wow. And we have to make that demonstration. And then we get the accreditation where we're able to then say to banks, um, we want to do uh, more large and voluminous sort of conveyancing work. And we meet your requirements already because look, here we go. We have this uh, large sort of scale accreditation. So it, it works in a few different ways, I would say. So there's the initial get authorized, that's a process. We have an annual renewal of practicing certificates and our status as a business which is regulated and professional indemnity insurance is um, very, it, it's a very tough market for, for law firms. These policy premiums are often very expensive and uh, there aren't many insurers in the market because of the amount of risks uh, that a law firm business can get itself involved in through it, it could be matters of money laundering um it could be the fact that we hold so much sensitive information about people businesses and their matters uh and we obviously employ people as well so there's quite a few different ways within which cyber security can from a compliance perspective become a problem um mm -hmm. but as i say our, our business is a contemporary one we you know we started at a similar time when sonar it started so we don't we don't see these things as problems we see it as this is the uh, the the sort of business environment that exists at the time of us starting to do business in this space and how do we turn this into something good for us rather than uh something negative and, yeah, and the way that we view it is we have very good cyber security it gives us the it gives us the edge, you know. If we're competing for a piece of work, if there's a beauty parade involved, uh, obviously on the tender side of things, as I've mentioned already, it's a more formal process. And some often often cyber security is a um, it's a disqualifying criteria in in some tenders. And there are scenarios in in the business world where, um, and again, this goes far broader than just law firms. A, a business may have their eyes on uh, a tender and 
only when when it's too late they find out that they don't actually qualify because of cybersecurity um, infrastructure not being in place, and then to retrospectively do it or or to do it, you you kind of just mess up. You're out of sync with the timeline at that point. You know you can't. Uh, get in time for the tender and you can't set up your cyber security quick enough but then you obviously it, it doesn't come free and mm. it doesn't often come cheap but then you've kind of lost the the, the timing of it is all off then so you have to do wow. it i would say in most if not all spaces and you have to do it early so wow. josh you you couldn't get a better testimonial than this from Akbar. Of the course, question, not. That's, that's why I brought it on. The I question, can, particularly from I a law firm and a lawyer, but I, I how long how long did it take you? I yeah, appreciate it, you saying that, Akbar. How long did it take you to set all this up for? Um, not long. So I think it, it's what we call greenfield. So it, we're quite lucky that, uh, as I said, we're kind of on the same journey and we started at the same time. So. Uh, it was basically starting it up afresh. So in that sense, it's a lot easier to get all the policies and the processes in place, as well as, you know, the basics, just getting up the PC and uh, setting up their emails. Whereas if, you know, if it was an existing company, uh, there's a lot more work involved, especially if they already have an IT guy or an IT company and they've not been performing. Um, they, there's a lot of things that, you know, we, we, when we bring on new business and we, we do bring this all to clients a lot of the time because you you trust that IT provider there's a lot of the time you don't know what's going on um, behind closed doors and a lot of the time it's a massive massive mess and there's a lot of work to involve to have to tidy up and keep that business pure. so for Atma in that sense he, he was quite lucky that he was starting new because we set everything up from the get-go it's been easy to maintain ever since so if I was a small business I'm listening in well, I am a small business and I am listening in. <laughs> so I don't pretend actually. Um, and so I came, I come to you and I say, you know, I've got a business. I have any cyber security around my business um, and I need IT support. But what, tell, walk us through. What's, what's the process of that? So what we like to do, and I, I hate doing proposals without having an audit in place. So the first thing you do is an audit. So that would be coming in, reviewing all your systems from your emails, how you're using your files, and just understand how you work as a business, find out who the main money makers are, and essentially the, the VIP people. And that's where we kind of start there and work our way backwards. Um, and we basically, we, we have a lot to put together a report, sit down and pinpoint the main issues. So in, in a simple sense, we would but tear apart your current IT infrastructure and, and find the gaps in security and then put together a proposal on how to amend those and maintain those going forward. Right. Wow. And, and, and Josh, that phrase you use, you like to identify the money makers and the VIP people. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, a lot, a lot of people think, you know, that's the sales department, but it could be anything from the CEO to, you know, the, the receptionist. It, it, it all depends on, you know, the business. And, those not that those people get special treatment, but we make sure that they have the, the, the extra care needed and redundancy in place. Should you know a PC go down, we make sure we've got a spare PC ready to go and, and plugged in and, and whatnot. This is a very, very key part of running any business, having VIPs up and running, right? So, very interesting, it is, it is. And so, for you, um, placing yourself in the center of London, does that mean? All your clients are there, or do you reach out beyond? Oh, uh, so we're actually international, believe it or not. So we've got clients in Australia, New Zealand, the US, uh, Eastern Europe, and France, literally everywhere. Um, so most of the stuff we do is it's remote, but it's nice to be able to do boots on the ground. So some scenarios such as the internet going down, obviously you can't connect on remotely because there's no internet. So that's when we would send someone out. Um, we are in, in London, because most of our clients are, and it's easy to, to travel and service them. But as I say, most of the stuff we do is remote. Right, right, right. So, And um, how many clients have you got now, Josh? I've got 27 now, as, as of yesterday. 27, and it's only been 27 months since you started? It would take, yeah, that's about right. Um, and then, yeah, so, so some of them are, you know, one or two users, and some are 250 users. So there's a very large variety out there. Very interesting to ask the question, how many clients have you got? 27. Not many people say the exact number of clients. No, that's really nice. <laughs> you're, I think you're, you're, you're very invested in them, aren't you? You know. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the thing with uh, being a smaller company. You know, we're only eight staff ourselves. 
we and it's something I want to maintain as we grow as, as a business is to always have that personal touch. But when you call up, I think it's 90 or 87 percent of calls are resolved on the phone. Obviously, some things require a bit more attention and a bit more troubleshooting and they get escalated. But we aim to fix everything then and there on the phone. And I think that serves us very well. A lot of other IT companies will call up and go, okay, let me write that down. They'll send you a ticket to so get an email reference. And then it just goes back and forth for days. And it's frustrating for the client. And it, it, most, most of the time when that happens, it's because the IT company is uh, understaffed and uh, usually people are underpaid as well. Um, and I, I've, I've seen it quite a lot in the IT industry, especially in uh, the MST business, which we are, uh, just for reference is that a lot of people are underpaid and understaffed and people just caring and that. As being a, a young business owner myself, I always try and uh, make sure everyone is, is happy. I give people extra days off, mental health days if they need it, or do their day, however you want to call it. Um, and always try and give up bonuses and take people out for lunch. Show them that I care, because at the end of the day, I, I don't have a business without my staff, so I've got to make sure I look after them. And that then extends to our clients as well. And Josh, we hear all the time about companies uh being scammed and hacked and ransomware and it's endless now coming in on our personal phones we're getting endless sms's trying to get us to pay something or pay some fake energy bills fake everything now yeah. clients like akbar's uh, ali legal is are, are they being subject to attack all the time by yeah, your 27 clients all the yeah, time daily. they're being Everyone. attacked so uh, one in three businesses last year were hacked in the UK. One in three. Uh, one in three. Uh, and a lot of the time you don't even know you've been hacked. So they will sit there gathering information and you know forwarding on your clients' details, transactions for a period of time. It could be a year, it could be five years. Um, and then one day they will essentially strike and whether that's they hit you with ransomware and make you pay you in Bitcoin um, or they, they just start threatening you and get you to do other things. Um, they are in your business for a very, very long time, which I think is quite different for most. It's essentially like someone's you know, watching you sleep in, in a sense. Wow. And can you see them trying to get in all the time? Yeah, 100%. Uh, so we set out something called, and it's automated once it's set up, it's called suspicious logins and risky signings. Um, so we can see people trying to log into Apple's email account from Russia. Um, oh, I, I don't China. need to hear this. I don't, I don't need to know about this. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't scare the, uh, the clients with it but it's because we're so proactive it's it's something we have to deal with every day and especially since the, the russian ukraine scenario uh cyber crime has gone up 300 percent in the last few months because so of the war russia. cyber crime is accelerating yeah, ma mainly from from russia trying to hack to all the businesses um and the, the sad thing is is these are the one these are the kind of companies that will get breached because you're an SMB, a lot of the time you think we're not we're not large enough to have IT. We don't want to justify that cost. It's, you know, but we'd get that when we're 100 members of staff. But being a smaller business owner, you don't have your IT set up and you're quite literally being targeted. So you're, if you don't have cybersecurity in place, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when you're going to be breached. What would they be hacking? So why would they hack into our small business? Well, they can just get your bank details. They can uh, send, as so much said, fake invoices. So someone we were speaking to yesterday who came in to visit us, um, one of their clients got hacked and they were sending out invoices that were due, but they changed all the bank detail. All oh. the clients have then paid, we went to a different bank account. And we're not talking, you know, a couple of hundred pounds, we're talking tens of thousands of pounds. This is one, one person we were speaking to. God knows who else they, they reached. Oh, my God, we've got to sort out our cyber security, haven't we? Yeah. It's, I've, never, see, I've never really understood it because I've always thought, is this just something that big companies would need? So No, would... it's, it's an investment. And it's, I don't know. I mean, what can you... Uh, what price can you put on the reputation for your business to start off if, if you know Bit 100 got hacked or Ali Legal got hacked and you know they nine times out of ten they do email your clients so you then have yeah. to rebuild that trust and that relationship and sometimes you can't um there's some businesses in the IT world that we specifically don't work with and um, not that we have in the past but we've, we'll never even have a conversation with them because they've been hacked and, and how do I get in when what do you mean oh it's so when there's different ways of doing it so you have something called pitch an email which um it will be as thomas said they can pretend they're from tesco's or you know sage accounts and then they'll get you to sign up on their fake website and get your details and then use that to hack to the actual website and um, they can do social engineering so if you're posting too much on uh facebook or linkedin 
uh, they can get the details off there and target them through there. I was reading a post the other day where um, a new member of staff at a business, uh, she was there for two days. She got emailed directly by her boss um, and then went out and got loads of Apple Store cards, I think, and it was hundreds of pounds. Um, but because they had, the company had posted that they had a new starter, someone had saw that, got her email address and then targeted her. But there's, there's hundreds of different ways. Um, the main one actually is um, user mistakes, user error. So mm -hmm. someone within the business accidentally clicking on the link or doing something silly without realizing. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all busy, we're running around like headless chickens. We've got loads of emails coming in, loads of meetings back to back. You do make mistakes, and that's where uh, the cyber criminals will jump in. But you're, you've made a mistake because you're tired or you're stressed, and that's, that's all they need. It's just that one slip up, and they're in. It's not if, uh, just, no. if I if I could just offer up an insight actually on on this in particular because this is obviously a form of um, cybersecurity breach where essentially a payment transaction has it is intercepted. So in general business, that's um, you know I've sent you an invoice. Here's some bank details. Somebody gets um, access to that communication, intercepts it, changes bank details, and reroutes funds now that is exacerbated quite severely for us as a law firm because not only do we pay for suppliers and receive payment of our invoices we also handle client money for transactions and we do corporate transactions we do property ones and these are this is millions this is tens of millions and in in the large cases and we haven't done it yet but we'll certainly head that way where we'll be involved in transactions in the hundreds of millions so the insurance that we have for um, professional indemnity also require us um, as a as a compulsory requirement. And again, we don't we don't view it as a problem, and we don't view it as a as a compliance bid, and we, we actually view it as a good thing. They actually require us to maintain uh, cybersecurity insurance as well, and obtaining that policy and the costing of that premium. They do evaluate what cybersecurity implementations infrastructure we have in place to to set that premium and and for them to evaluate their own risk. Because we can, uh, we Agba, can say, when you've got a new when you've got a new employee coming into your firm, you're a team of eight. I'm sure you're very choosy of who you hire, we, we, and they're we are, joining your network. Does does Josh does Josh profile them or assess them yeah. in some? way to see whether they are a safe hire for you from a yes yeah, so we we've of course we've gone through this um you know go, going from a startup law firm to um a maturing one a one that's becoming more uh, sophisticated in terms of processes and systems so sonar it actually um not only are, are they involved quite early with um the profiling of who who we are interviewing who we select as candidates who we select as an ultimate person who who will join us but sonar it actually do an induction piece for us as well so they um they get involved in the onboarding process from the it systems controls um and the security side of things oh to, so they teach actually... new employees how to use all the systems yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there is a broader piece involved in that. So Sonar IT provide a component of it. So we, are, we have a case management system. We have, um, you know, there's the marketing and BD side of things of our business. So there's, there's different people involved in different components of uh, what is effectively an induction process. And Sonar IT's um, input into that is key. So for example, um, nobody from this firm will ever um, send money to an account uh, until they've spoken to the recipient on, on the phone or, or a representative of a recipient of the business and verify those account details over the phone because that's an added layer and a measure and look as josh says human error still does happen a digit could still be entered wrong and this is why we have an insurance policy for a, a mistaken payment being being done in a particular way um, and josh do, do you an added layer do you, Josh, do you, when you're setting up a new employee, like somebody who's joining Akbar's firm, hmm. do you do you teach them how how they might be hacked with these dodgy messages, dodgy emails, misleading? Yeah, so about 30% of breaches are user error. So if you kind of take into account the amount of different ways to get hacked, that's a very large percentage. So it's through basically a message. 
message, clicking on the wrong link, click on the wrong website, mm. downloading off the, you know, not the official website. Um, so we, we try and do user awareness training as much as possible. Uh, so as I say, users are the biggest threat. You can work at HSBC and their user will still somehow get a virus and they've just got all the cyber security in place. But it, user awareness training and being aware of that and trying to educate people is quite a, a key part of our role. So one third is user error. What are the other two thirds? The breach. Oh, they're, 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 the percentage is a lot smaller, but you've got social engineering, fishing, you've got brute force attack, which is where someone's just, you're just trying to guess your password. And it, usually this is all automated. It's not something I always have to explain to you because no one's sitting there targeting Sonar IT personally because they hate me. They're doing hundreds of thousands at, I mean, someone might be, but they're doing it uh, hundreds of thousands at. You know, any given time, and it's just if they get lucky. oh, so they're just knocking on doors, waiting yeah, for the door it, to open. So you you can download something uh, called Linux, which is like a an, another operating system similar to Mac or Windows, and there's something called Kali Linux. I'm not saying every hacker uses this. I'm sure there's loads of different ways, um, but there's systems that are called to automate these processes and to lot automate processes. hacking. Yeah, well, you, it, it's it's created for pen testing, so it's meant to be what we call white hat, white hat hacker. So somebody's there to improve. Oh, I see. Okay, but there's obviously the, the dark side to it, and a lot of people, um, you know, use that for evil, if you will. But, I mean, nowadays you don't even need to be an IT guy or you know, tech illiterate because you can go on the dark web and you can buy these tools that do it for you. So there's um. I can't remember the name of the program, but you can go on the dark web and it's the, the low, it's all branded like an official bit of software. So appearing with a uh, burglar mask on and you can download that and you can send it to people. And what it does is it takes all your passwords and all your cash out of Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge because everyone hits their password, right? So everything's all there and it takes it, puts it into their uh, browser on their computer and they can just log in and be you. And that, that skips multi-factor authentication because Nowadays, passwords are twentieth century solution for twenty first century. Oh, if we've um, if we ter- sorry, Thomas, I just want to ask a question. But is, do you want to relate to that? No, no, go ahead. I've got my question, but you you press on. So, if we've terrified people now, I hope well, not. I'm totally, I mean, totally <laughs> terrified. I'm totally terrified. Um, I'm just wanting you to send me the invoice so I can sign up straight away. Um, <laughs> Uh, and um, so we've terrified people. What is your what is the model for people? How how do people work with you? I mean, we've got we've model? got different packages, and we don't try and get our clients to to fit into our package. You know, a lot of them are do become bespoke because people require different levels of security or different levels of support. So the starting package is thirty five pound per user per month. And the reason we do per user per month is because the security tools have to extend to each user, so it covers the cost of that. That gives you all your cybersecurity tools, so your spam filtering, your device encryption, uh, antivirus, web filtering, things like that. Um, and then depending on how much support you need, it then goes up to £65, and then the next one up is 90 Are we? But I think you could just send me that invoice. I'll, I'll, send, I'll send that over. But we, unlike a lot of other IT companies, I try and invest in our clients. So a lot of things we, we don't charge for in terms of cybersecurity, because I, I see that as a win-win, we're an extension of your business. And as I said earlier, we, we try and be a partner. Um, mm-hmm. So we, we don't necessarily lose money, but we invest and in, I don't charge for certain tools because I would rather have an easy life or an easier life, I guess. And yeah. I want my clients to also have an easy life because other IT companies will charge for certain things. People, A, don't understand what they're buying or B, don't see the value. So they don't sign up for it. But having these extra layers security it, it's a win-win because we don't have to deal with you being hacked you haven't lost you know tens of yeah. thousands of pounds you haven't lost downtime and your reputation is my risk so it's as i said it's a win-win scenario no it's fantastic it's absolutely fantastic so i know thomas and i when we got to know you josh you, you know you do care hugely about your clients which was really important to us um but also, you've really got a sort of vision of how you feel the IT support industry should be. I don't know if you would like to share that as we go to the close of this. Yeah, show. so I, I find it's it's a race to the bottom. Um, and I mean that in terms of pricing. But I, mean, I know money's not everything. The reason I, I say that is because if you, you're not charging the appropriate amount, you're not getting the, the qualified staff or the staff with the right expertise because they're off chasing, you know, getting get more money elsewhere. Um, so it's a vicious cycle in that sense. So what, what I'm trying to do is not, I don't charge a lot, um, but I am a lot more expensive than other IT companies. But the value you get in that is you get all the cybersecurity tools and 
included in the price, but you don't get that with other companies. What they do, right. they entice you uh, with the, the low support costs. But if you want security, then it, you know there's add-ons and things like that. So um, I am just trying to. I basically go against the brain. I'm the only IT company I know that has the business model that we have. Um, everything is all about getting people to sign up for a year and then throwing add-ons to them. Um, and the, the, one of the main reasons I do that is because I, not at Sony my team, but previous work bases, I've been involved with some horrific incidences. Um, and one of them was, it was a 200 user recruitment company. And it, I think it was five pound a month per person for antivirus, standard antivirus, and they didn't want to pay for it. So that's 200 different people with no antivirus, no protection whatsoever. Uh, and they got encrypted, they got ransomware. Uh, their finance department was just shut down for, for days and weeks. Uh, and that all been prevented because they, if they had antivirus, it would have stopped it. So, so, I, so people come to you, so you look at it, of what is the IT support that they need? And then you're including this. So what's so yeah. an example of the type of IT support? That oh, it can it can be anything from, you know, my PT slides to the classic kind of off and back on again to something more complex sort of setting up a whole cloud infrastructure. Uh, so, for example, we're dealing with another tech company at the moment where we've set up a whole network in the cloud. So they've got cloud servers, uh, VPNs that are all cloud-based. But it can be, you know, something really small to something very large scale and, in terms of my background, I've worked with, you know, alongside Citibank, I've helped be involved with some of the largest estate agents in South London, get them um, up to date from their, their old school platform. Um, so, yeah, there's not anything we haven't really been involved in. And, and between me and Nikki, my business partner, um, our expertise, I would like to say it, it, with confidence that there's not an issue we've not seen or, or dealt with in the past. No, absolutely brilliant. So, Akbar, what what Josh is actually delivering for you is a good night's sleep. Is that is that basically what? Oh, absolutely. Done? That 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 is actually the best way to put it, and I couldn't put it better myself. It's completely peace of mind. Um, this is one of those areas that I think a lot of this industry has become quite um, commoditized, quite packaged up. And I say that from a perspective of I'm a corporate lawyer. I buy and sell IT companies as well. I get involved in in that legal work. So I've actually seen the inner intricacies of Josh's competitors. And, and, and some of them, I've known them far longer than I have um, Josh uh, and Sonar IT. And, and yet uh, it is Sonar IT that we partnered with. And that, and that is because of, as Josh has already alluded to, there's that kind of bronze, silver, gold packaging of these services. It is quite a technical service. It's quite complicated. And, you know, I, I don't understand all things cybersecurity, but what I need is safety, comfort, security, a safe pair of hands. And I think if you're getting into the quibbling about fees and charges here and there, and you're having to monitor that quite closely, that could be telling about your relationship between the two businesses. Mm. With Josh, I I mean, I, I received the invoices, we pay them. I obviously glance at them. We have monetary controls at our end as well. But I'm never um, here sort of thinking, you know, I've been I've been overcharged or I'm not getting the thing that I paid for that often, you know, uncomfortable scenario people end up in is because we are uh, getting the benefit of that That's peaceful brilliant. sleep brilliant. at night, as you say, as you put it. Uh, it's been fantastic. It's just been, I'm, I'm actually so excited about this show. I wanted to share it wide mm. and hope that as a result of this of you as a case study at bar and josh and the passion and the ethics you have around this i hope that we've helped more people find a great supply in this and um so as we come to a close thank you so much josh thank you so much akbar thomas see i let you back quite a lot this time and um <laughs> and you know if you're watching this back please do go to spotify and look up the bit 100 or all the apple or any of your chosen podcasts because we've got some fabulous suppliers. I mean, we put a lot of time into making sure that we bring experts into our community that have strong values and a real commitment to their expertise. Um, and we know how important it is to have the right suppliers. Everybody chases the clients, but my goodness, if you don't have the right suppliers, today we have really shown how important it is. And um, Josh, my first action after this is to um, send you a message, get that set up for us. I thought, you know, we're just... Uh, a little little company now, Thomas and I have. It, it, it has a good punch in the market. 
Well, um, prevention's better than cure, right? Oh, no, absolutely. So <laughs> thank you very much for that consulting that you've given us today. Uh, and again, thank you, Akbar, for such genuine honesty and openness about your business. Hey, the, the dogs are... Uh, Oh, the dog's dog's making itself man. Thank it's you for coming on the show, Akbar. Yeah, absolutely. So if you Thank want you to um, look up Akbar Ali, uh, if you're not actually watching the screen, you won't see his name. It's Akbar A K B A R, and then second word surname Ali. Sounds like you've got a fantastic law firm there, Akbar. Thank and you. obviously, as I mentioned earlier, Josh Bevis. Look him up on LinkedIn. Josh, as in J-O-S-H, Bevis, B-E-V-I-S, and that's Sonar IT. So um, thank you very much, gentlemen. That was a really brilliant show. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you all.